Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third and final webinar in this series on workforce development hosted by the Minnesota Transformation Initiative, or MTI. MTI is a project funded by the Minnesota Department of Human Services to support the transition of people with disabilities receiving some minimum wages into competitive integrated employment. Having a stable, well-trained workforce is critical to providing high quality and effective supports to people with disabilities to find and keep employment and to live and be connected within their communities. We're grateful to have Megan Sanders joining us again today to talk about implementing a credentialing program in order to help retain staff. Megan is a national workforce consultant at the University of Minnesota's Institute on Community Integration. She provides training, consultation, and technical assistance to provider organizations, states, and individuals to address workforce challenges for direct support professionals and frontline supervisors. Before joining the ICI staff in 2020, Sanders worked as a direct support professional and frontline supervisor. She earned a master's degree in social work and master's degree in public policy from the University of Minnesota and a bachelor's degree from Truman State University. Thanks again for joining us, Megan. Welcome. Thanks, Danielle, and thanks everybody for being here today. Um, I'm glad to join you, as Danielle said, for the third and final time today um, as we talk about another workforce strategy. Obviously, we have not covered all of the workforce strategies in three simple sessions, um, but this, these are meant to give you a good start. Um, so before we truly get started, just want to make sure we're all on the same page as Zoom as some of us, like me, live on Zoom and some of us um, don't frequent Zoom as much. If you're having trouble hearing me, I'm officially talking. We have started. Um, you can go to your audio settings. Um, if I'm too quiet or too loud, if you're experiencing audio issues throughout, please put in the chat and Danielle will interrupt me and make sure that you all can hear. Um, our closed captionings have been enabled, so you should be able to use those as well. Um, and our chat feature is also enabled. Um, so you should all be able to chat amongst yourselves. Um, everyone will be able to see your chats. Um, I see Sherry just put in the, uh, in the chat, hello. Um, so we love that that you're interacting and things like that. I'll be asking you some questions throughout. Um, so we really do encourage you to use that chat so we can um, learn from each other. Um, I'm gonna pause. I see that there's a hand raised. Is there a question? Okay. Um, if you do have questions, um, we will have time at the end for any questions that you have. Um, it's easiest if you put your questions in the Q&A uh, panel box. Um, that's easier for us to see and keep track of because um, the chat might be going quickly at different times. Um, at the end, when we do questions, you can also raise your hand and we can unmute you. Um, right now, you all are muted. Your cameras are off. We cannot see or hear you. So if you're worried about that, that is covered. Um, and if you're having any Zoom issues, feel free to post in the chat and um, we'll do our best to problem solve those. So uh, myself and my colleague Danielle uh, both work at the Institute of Community Integration. And our focus at ICI is to make sure that all people with disabilities are valued by and contribute to their communities of choice. And at ICI, we have um, over 30 years of research and technical assistance saying that that's not possible without a quality workforce who sticks around, who provides quality supports, and who are well trained. Um, so we have these webinars and a bunch of other resources because we know that um, workforce is essential. Um, we need the workforce in order to provide quality supports. Um, so today, our focus is going to be uh, professionalizing the role of DSPs. We're going to talk about um, career ladders, credentialing, career pathways, career lattices. You might have heard some of those terms. You might have heard all of those terms. You might have heard none of those terms. I'm going to define those so we're all going to be on the same page by the end of the webinar. Um, and then we'll hopefully have some time to reflect on if implementing a program at your organization is right for you and for your organization um, and kind of talk about what those next steps might be for you at your organization. Uh, before we get started, this is the third webinar that I have done this for, um, but I like to know who I'm talking to. Um, so Danielle's gonna launch a poll um, and if you could select uh, what your roles are in direct support and you can select as many 
um, roles as you want and then click submit. I imagine if you're a supervisor, or leader in a provider organization, you're probably also providing direct support um, because we know <laughs> those shortages exist. So it's okay to press both of those if that exists for you. And yes, if you click other, please put that in the chat. I'm seeing HR, uh, specialist, business partner, managers. That is one that I neglected to include on here. Give it 15, 20 more seconds. And these polls are anonymous, so um, I'll be asking other questions later on, and we're not tracking who's answering what. So if you're worried about, you know, us knowing things about you, we're, we don't know who's saying what. All right, we can end the poll and share results. So most of you are supervisor um, or leader in a provider organization or seeing a lot of um, HR or recruiters um, and then some in other areas as well. So I'll make sure, um, I'll do my best to make sure that this applies to all of you and you can all get something out of this webinar today. Um, stop sharing. Okay, so um, in the past two webinars, I have explained what a DSP is. I'm going to let this short clip explain what a DSP is this time. Their job title is Direct Support Professional, or DSP. But some may know this job as personal care assistant, home health aide, or certified nursing assistant. The role of the DSP is all of these and more. DSPs support people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in living full, productive lives. The work is highly complex and demands skill and training, dedication, and high ethical standards. Being a DSP requires more than just providing physical assistance with daily living routines. Of critical importance, it's about connecting people socially and ensuring that they're valued members of their communities. So that was just a quick clip to make sure we're on the same page as to who a DSP is before we get started. Um, and just a quick uh, side note, um, this is one of the many films that we've created at ICI called Invaluable um, that really focuses on why a DSP is so important and the how it is unrecognized and um, how the role is so important. So you can go to the Z-Link on your screen to get more information there. It will let me go on. Okay. <laughs> so um, professionalizing the role of DSP, like we just saw, and like all of you know, it is a very important profession. Um, and it is a very hard profession. Um, it's often called entry level uh, and consists of many different skills and training that you need in order to do the job. And DSP might in any day uh, engage in the roles that you see on, on your screen. So it might be teaching a new, uh, a new skill to a person they're supporting, um, might be driving someone somewhere they need to go, uh, might be uh, helping them with some PT, physical therapist stuff they need to do, um, any role, any day they might be engaging in all of this. So it's a really complex job and it's something that um, people outside the field don't always know. And we really want to make sure that we're keeping this in mind from the start at recruitment to selection and hiring to training someone to recognizing and keeping the staff that we already have that we keep this in mind that this is a really complex role that takes a lot of skill. Um, and, and there's no easy answer to fixing our many workforce issues that we have, right? We all know that we have some pretty extreme shortages across the United States. It's not a specific issue in your specific organization. It's not specific to Minnesota. It's across the country. Um, and we know based on research in other industries and through national discussions that creating a credentialing structure or um, developing and implementing competency-based career pathways are really good ways to ensure that people are getting the training that they need 
um, and, and able to specialize their skills while also recognizing that they are developing those skills and professionalizing that field. So pairing those credentials or um, career pathways with wage increases um, is also important to this as well. We also know that there are key factors that continue to undermine that professionalization of the role, right? So that includes um, a lack of investment in the workforce by both state governments, federal agencies across long-term services and supports. Um, we know that there's a lack of standard occupational classification within the Bureau of Labor Statistics, and that's a fancy way of saying that there's no um, specific code for this profession within the Bureau of Labor Statistics, so it's really hard to track and follow um, DSPs and their wages. <clears throat> and if you have more questions about that, I could talk about that for a long time, um, but that's not our focus today. Um, we also know that there's a lack of data to measure fiscal or service impacts that DSPs make. And we also know that there's a lack of systemic solutions to meet the growing demand for this workforce. Um, we know that the shortage is not going away um, and COVID has only um, amplified the shortage. Um, and we also know that there's a lot going on nationally um, and in states uh, to, to start this work and to start professionalizing the DSP role. And we'll talk about some of that today. Um, so before we move on to talking about what career pathways are, um, I wanna know if you currently use a career pathway program in your organization. Um, and if you're not sure what that is, you can just click unsure and we'll talk about it in the next slide. Um, so Danielle, you can launch that poll. Thank you. at about 10 more seconds. Okay, we can end that poll and share those results. So about half of you do not have a career pathway program currently established in your organization. You're in the right place, that's great to hear. Um, about a quarter of you do, which is also great to hear. Uh, pathway programs can always be expanded and developed further. Um, so you are also in the right place. And we would also love for you to share your experiences in the chat um, about what your career pathway program looks like um, and, and how it's worked for you in your organization. And for those who are unsure, um, we'll talk about what that is now. So I'm going to be using a lot of these words throughout um, the presentation today um, and want to make sure that we're all on the same page as to what these are. Um, so career pathways is an overarching um, term that is the ability to grow in a field to more skilled positions that typically pay a higher wage. In this field, the most likely career pathway is probably a DSP to a supervisor, right? Um, that is the career pathway that I took when I was a DSP. I started as a DSP, um, grew my skills, and then became a frontline supervisor. Um, there are many other pathways out there. Something that organizations can use to support career pathways are credentials, which are state um, or nationally recognized training requirements that are paired with some kind of assessment. So maybe like a test or um, observation on the job or some kind of um, writing piece that says how they've applied this to their job or reflect on it, um, where the worker earns a specialized certificate or degree. And this can be like academic, like I received a master's, that's a credential. Um, but they can also be outside of academia. So it can be, um, we'll talk about some examples later, but it can be different kinds of certificates or credentials that are based on training that people get. Um, 
Career ladders and lattices are pathways developed in an organization that allow workers to gain professional recognition um, and usually some kind of wage enhancement for training and specialized skills that they might develop. Um, so credentials might be a part of career ladders and lattices, right? Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to interact with each other. Uh, when we're talking about ladders versus lattices, um, ladders are one specific pathway, right? So one way to go, you have one option to get promoted um, in long-term services and supports. It's usually from a direct support professional, a DSP, to a frontline supervisor, an FLS, and that's kind of the ladder that you follow. You continue to um, add uh, more and more supervision skills, um, but there are other alternatives. Uh, one being a career lattice. And what you see on your screen is a career lattice, and it really allows people to um, be in the field that they wanna be while continuing to grow, continuing to gain skills, continuing to get paid more for those skills and um, growth that they're developing, um, but still stay as a DSP, right? Because not all DSPs wanna become supervisors. Um, so having that flexibility for people to stay in DSP and grow their skills from a foundational DSP to a DSP one, to a DSP two, to a DSP three, or move laterally to a supervisory position where they can develop their skills and become a supervisor, and then a supervisor one, a supervisor two, and can continue to grow their skills that way. So lattices can be really long, have more than just DSP, frontline supervisor, you can have other ladders as well. But it essentially means that people have more opportunity to move within the fields that make the most sense to them in the current time. Um, if you have any questions about a ladder versus a lattice or a career pathway or a credential, feel free to post those in the Q&A or the chat and I can try to make that a little clearer. Um, we'll have some examples in just a second as well. So when you're thinking about um, career pathways, whether that means expanding the one you already have, whether that means starting one fresh from scratch, um, whether that means um, using credentials or using um, career lattices, um, we know that career pathways improve the skill of workers because they can continue to grow. We know that it creates those professional career paths so professionalizing the role, showing the value of being a DSP. You don't have to um, move to frontline supervise in order to make more money. You can continue to specialize in your own field, um, just like maybe a nurse would or someone else in a similar profession. Um, we know that um, quality and safety of supports are improved with career pathways or credentials because um, when the skills are when the skills of the worker are improved, so are the supports. So we also know that the outcomes of people supported are improved as well. Um, and this is all backed by our research that we've done at ICI. This is not just stuff that I've pulled out of my head. Um, so if you want, these all come from different resources. So if you want some of those resources, I can um, send some of those to you. We also know that this improves pay and benefits, which is something that's really important right now, right? Um, a lot of people leave this field because they're not getting paid enough. So this is something that can help improve that pay. Um, this is something that can improve access to competency-based education and training because by creating this pathway and really establishing your training program can really create more access to training that people want. It also improves the retention and tenure of DSPs. And by improving your retention and tenure of DSPs, that means you have fewer new DSPs entering your organization, which means you have to spend, you don't have to spend as much on hiring, as much on recruitment, um, as much on that initial training. So you're saving money on that front end because you're keeping your DSPs rather than having that revolving door where DSPs keep coming in and leaving. It also increases job satisfaction um, and DSPs who were engaged in a credentialing or career pathway program um, said that they were less likely to leave. Um, some said they were less likely to leave their organization and some said that they were less likely to leave the field in general, which is great. Um, so the, the, a career pathway has a ton of really great benefits. Um, so a really good thing for an organization to consider. 
Now we're talking about um, today how to improve um, the workforce at your organization. Um, and with that, there are credentialing programs that organizations can use to develop those career pathways at the organ organization. So they don't have to start from scratch. Um, you can start with some of the credentials that are already there and already well made. I've included some examples on the screen and we'll talk more about them in a minute, but I know that there are more than what's out, what's on the screen. I already know a few that I don't have on this list. Um, so I'm about to ask you, um, which ones have you heard of? Um, Danielle, you can launch that poll. And again, if you haven't heard of any of these, that's okay. Um, but if you have, let me know. Um, and if you know of others, please put those in the chat so that people can, can learn from each other. And yes, we do have the, we do post the recording. Danielle just responded in the chat. We will have the recording and the slides after the training. SHRM PMQ is one of them. I don't personally know that one. That doesn't mean anything, but um, that's one that exists um, in this pro I will be Googling after this. We'll give five more seconds. I realize I didn't have a none of the above option, so some of you can't answer this. Okay, Danielle, you can stop that and share. Um, so it seems like a lot of you have heard of a lot of these programs. Um, I'm still going to talk about them because still only even the most that you've heard of, 63% of you have heard of the NADSP Voluntary Credentialing Program. So I'm still going to talk about each of them, um, but it's good to know that a lot of you know these already exist and are out there and are um, resources for you to use at your organization. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is an employee employment specific credential. Um, this one is the Certified Employment Support Professional Credential or CESP. Um, and this is one credential level. Um, some are, are more laddered, but this is just one credential level. Um, and the requirements to get this credential um, are a high school diploma, which is GED or equivalent, um, some amount of experience, training, signing a code of conduct and an examination. Um, and another one that is employment specific would be the ACRE credential. Um, so that is another one as well. Does anybody else in, know of any other employment specific credentials that they want to put in the chat right now? If not, that's okay. I just have a lot to learn from you all about the credentials that exist across the country. Um, so the SHRM PMQ is Society for Human Resources People manager qualification. That's quite the mouthful. Um, I'll be looking that one up though. Okay. So another less specific one for all DSPs is the um, NADSP, so the National Alliance for Direct Support Professionals Voluntary Credentialing Program. And if you want to know more about this, I thought about sending you all the links, but that would be too many links. These are ones that you can just Google and they'll pop right up and you'll be able to find them pretty, pretty easily. Um, NADSP is an organization that does a lot of different things, but one of the things that they do is their eBadge Academy and credentialing program. Um, and they have a bunch of eBadges that people can um, prove that they have the skills in and earn. And if they earn a certain um, number of badges in a certain number of areas, they become credentialed. This one specifically, their credentialing program has um, four levels of credentials. So there's a DSP registered, which you don't need any e-badges for, you just need to sign the code of ethics. And then there's DSP one, two, one, two, and three. And then there's also the frontline supervisor. So again, creating those multiple options for people to become um, more skilled in the DSP, but also if they want to become a frontline supervisor, have that opportunity as well. 
Um, and this is a nationally known credentialing program. So was so were the last two I talked about. Um, many, like I said, organizations will use these credentials um, and these programs to build their career pathways. Um, one example is a bunch of organizations in New York, um, and this map might be kind of small on your screen, um, but we at ICI have been working with New York for a few years now um, to see what impact credentialing programs have on the different organizations you see on your screen. Um, so the requirements and credentials varied. Some of them did use the NADSP, um, NADSP voluntary credentialing program in their organization, but not all of them did. Um, we have a report out that compares these. It's pretty lengthy. Um, if you scroll to the bottom, it gives you more of a summary of what those are. Um, and New York has actually decided to expand the NADSP credentialing program statewide for all DSPs across the state. So that's an example of um, how someone has, how a few organizations have used a credentialing program and it's expanded to statewide. Another um, opportunity for uh, using credentialing in your organization is the direct course career ladders and credentialing model. As all of you who attended uh, webinar two know, at ICI, we create a lot of the um, content for direct course. And we have established a career ladders and credentialing model um, that is based on best practices, is customizable to your organization, and it provides you with the tools you need to implement it across your organization. So this is, we are not a credentialing body. That is not our plan, but these are tools that you can use within your organization. And our model aligns with any DSP. <clears throat> so it starts with that DSP foundations and then DSP one, two, three, and also has that frontline supervisor level as well. And if you wanna know more about these tools, you can email us um, at dswsolutions at umn.edu um, and we can get you more information on that. So when you're thinking about career pathways, there are a lot of things to consider, and I just threw a lot at you, um, and I'm going to continue to throw a lot at you, so it's a good thing this recording will be available afterwards. Um, but we know from our research that it is really important that you set aside initial costs and staff time, especially if you're going to be creating the pathway from scratch and the training program from scratch and not really using any of those resources that I mentioned before. Um, but even if you do use those resources that I mentioned before, most of them do cost money. Um, so it's important to set aside those initial costs and time that it's gonna take for um, like your administrative and training and HR and leadership staff to engage in developing a pathway. Um, and of course the DSPs as well who are going to be involved in giving feedback about these pathways. It's also important to know, just like with any training program, that support is really essential. So giving learners support in whatever ways they need is really important. And we talked a little bit in session two about how um, training might look different for folks who, who don't um, aren't strong in, in reading online um, or reading English. So it's important to have that specified learner support for each person that, um, that you have at your organization. On top of that, um, it's important to provide administrator and supervisor support as well, because they're going to be the ones directly working with the learners, right? So it's really important that all supervisors understand what you're trying to do and the goals and what kind of um, lift and time commitment that's going to be for the learners. If a learner wants to become a DSP too, how much time is that going to take the learner? And are you going to um, reduce their schedule so that they can put more hours into the training. And if you are going to do that, are you able to pay them for the time that they're spending engaging in the training? Following that, it's really important to build those wage incentives into the program. Um, I know of a few um, organizations in other states who have built um, with their career pathways built raises into their program. So um, once someone gets a certain credential, they get a raise. Um, other organizations do bonuses um, or other kinds of recognition 
we do know that wage incentives tend to produce the best results and tend to um, engage in that long-term retention. We also know that that's difficult for many providers and that you kind of have to re-navigate um, um, how, how your wage structure is built. We also know that organizations who implement successful career pathways collaborate with other organizations. And that could mean a lot of things. That could mean other provider organizations. Um, we've worked with some providers in another state who are part of a group of uh, providers um, and they have developed a credentialing program together. Um, so they've really worked with um, other provider organizations and everyone in that, who are in that, the collaborative gets the same training and the same credentials. Um, that does create other challenges, right? Because every provider organization has different goals. So it requires a lot of communication, but it might reduce some of that heavy lift um, that it will take to train people. Other organizations that you could collaborate with would be those credentialing um, organizations like NADSP, um, like the, the CESP uh, credential, um, could be uh, other training organizations, could be other research organizations so you understand that you're following best practices. Um, there are a lot of different ways you can collaborate to help ease your load a little bit and make it a little bit easier on your end and um, to continue to educate each other on what a successful career pathway is. Finally, it's really important to understand that career pathways will take time, both the development of the career pathways and then the results from the career pathways. Some organizations that we've worked with have found pretty instantaneous results um, with some really high great retention numbers. Uh, some organizations that has taken time. Um, in this specific report that these recommendations come from, it is said that some of the organizations it took up to three years to show positive results. So I know that that might not show right away, those high retention numbers, things like that might not show up right away, um, but you can kind of measure those little results um, to see if it's working. And you can check in with the people who are engaged in the career pathway and who are taking training to move up in your organization um, to see if they think it's working and if it's impacting the way that they're delivering services. So there are other ways besides just looking at that retention data, which might take a while to, check, to catch up, um, that can measure the success. I also wanna note here that um, career pathways are more than just a training program. Um, it can be just a training program, but a well-implemented career pathway means including it in all parts of your organization so that includes job descriptions. So having a job description for like, if you have three levels of DSPs, a job description for DSP1, DSP2, DSP3, um, and your hiring process would reflect that as well because not everybody who you hire is a new DSP, right? They might have different skills. Um, also including it in performance reviews and employee skills assessments, really understanding where people lie in the pathway and what skills they've developed and what skills they could develop to continue to grow in your organization. And then also including career pathways as part of your recognition program. Um, an organization I was working with in another state um, is actually one of our um, Moving Mountains Award winners, um, which is a recognition program that we've done that recognizes um, organizations who are doing really cool work. Um, one of the things that they did is uh, they let their staff engage in the NAD's PE badging program, and they were recognized for each e badge that they completed. Um, so they built that recognition into their recognition programs uh, and it became the NADSP competency areas became a part of their recognition and how they recognize people. So thinking about how career pathways or credentialing that you credentials that you may include in your organization um, might impact each of these areas from recruitment to selection and hiring to training to um, retention and recognition. Before I move on, um, I just want to pause and see if we have any questions. Looks like we don't have any yet, but I'm going to pause and give you time to 
put in the chat or the Q&A, any general questions about career pathways. Um, or if you were one of those organizations who said you have a career pathway in your organization, if you want to put in the chat what kind of practices you engage in and what maybe has worked or maybe you have a career pathway that's kind of not going well and you can explain what that looks like too. I'm going to give like a minute um, for any questions or comments about this. Are the other credentialing resources free or a cost? Um, the credentialing, so I'm not sure which thing this addresses. Um, the credentialing bodies, NADSP, um, the CESP credential, those kinds of things, they do cost money to engage in. Um, many organizations will uh, foot that bill on their end um, and not, and the DSP will not pay that cost. It'll be an organizational cost. Um, but it just depends on how you want to go through with that. If you're talking about the resources that I listed, the, the credentialing model that we created at ICI, um, if you have College of Direct Supports, uh, we can work with you to, um, to, to figure out what resources we can give you. And again, if you have questions about that, I'll put our email in the chat. You ever hosted a panel or roundtable for organizations that have career pathways or are interested in starting one to be able to share ideas and hear what kind of pathways are that have been created? No, but that is a really excellent idea. Um, at the end of this minute, I was going to say that if you know of other organizations who are engaging in this or in your research, you see a certain organization, maybe in another state, who has a really solid career pathway or credentialing program. Um, that you should connect with them. Uh, from my experience, they're happy to share their success um, because they want to improve the workforce as a whole, not just the workforce at their organization. Um, I have a question. Is there a specific site that has a free job board for nonprofits? Um, there are many of those. <laughs> I don't personally um, have those resources right now. I think you could probably um, Google that and, and see what kind of stuff is out there. And there are other resources available depending on who, who you engage with, whether that be who's, um, if you engage with uh, managed care organizations or other people, um, there are different training stipends or different um, ways to cover costs of training for providers. So it's worth looking, worth Googling when you're thinking about uh, training stipends and um, costs of training, because we know that can add up. Um, there are resources out there. Um, and I just got a response, a follow-up. Minnesota does not have free job boards for nonprofits. Again, I'm not super confident in my resources in that area. Um, but if anybody knows of anything, feel free to post it in the chat. Um, that's not something I did research on for this, unfortunately. Okay, seeing as there are no other questions, um, someone just put in the chat a nonprofit board. So thank you, Danielle, for putting that in the chat. Um, hopefully that's helpful. So when you're implementing, if you're thinking, wow, this all seems really great. This data is really wonderful. This might be a really good thing for my organization. Um, these are some considerations to make when you're going through the process. Um, I believe I shared these eight steps for implementation, which are um, backed in implementation science um, and are a really wonderful way. And yes, I know there are only four on your screen right now. There will be more. Are a really wonderful way to really make sure that the strategies that you're considering are the strategies that are going to work 
and that you're not wasting your time, money, and staff resources on things that aren't helping your workforce. Um, so the first step is to identify and assess the problem. Really look into the problem, use that data. If you want more information about what kind of data you can collect and you can use, um, that first webinar that we did um, talks about that. Um, the second is to obviously select whatever workforce strategy you're thinking of using. And the third is to identify those components. Um, and the fourth is to identify barriers to implementing whatever strategy you've decided. The fifth is to identify support. So you need your support and you need your barriers. The sixth is to put together a really good timeline with goals and progress um, to understand what each element is and who's doing each element, especially for something that could be complex like expanding or developing a career pathway in your organization. This is really important so you know whose job it is to do each thing. And so that as you meet each of those little goals, you can celebrate those little goals because it's important to celebrate everything that you're doing. And then seven is to actually do the strategy. So implement it, do it in your organization, start that career pathway, whatever that looks like. And then the eighth, state is, eighth step is to really evaluate that. So we're talking about step one, identifying and assessing the problem and we're relating it to developing a career pathway. Um, what is your data telling you? And what are the current problems at your organization? That's the first step you should be doing whenever you're thinking about doing a workforce solution. Um, if you are considering career pathways, some of the indicators that this might be a really good uh, solution for you um, or strategy for you would be high early turnover rates. Um, that early turnover rate uh, means that people who are leaving within the first six months um, might not have the right or thorough enough training to, um, to, to stay in an organization. So if you're having high early turnover rates, a career pathway might be a good choice. Um, higher terminations due to poor performance. Again, if you're having a lot of terminations due to poor performance, one of those things might be because they're not getting the right training and not understanding what the job is and what their expectations are. Um, another indicator might be high turnover in those who are tenured after a year. So those who have been around for more than a year, they have that initial training, they know what they're doing, but they're looking to continue to grow. This was why I left my organization that I worked for. Um, I uh, wanted to continue to grow and I didn't see a career pathway for me in my organization. I didn't have opportunities for continued training and development. And I really wanted to um, continue to grow and continue to take on more responsibility. Um, so those people are, are people to pay attention to as well. And then maybe you're doing like a satisfaction survey or stay interviews or exit interviews. Um, and you're hearing that staff want more professional development. That is a really good indicator for a career pathway. If staff are actively telling you, hey, I want more professional development, um, I want more training, I want to continue to learn how to do this one specific thing, that is a pretty good indication that a career pathway is a good way to go. This all being said, um, we know that training programs, not just for DSPs and supervisors, but across the United States, across um, all fields, we have places to go with these, right? We know all training programs can be improved. Um, we, we know that we can always train people better. Um, so pay attention to these challenges and know that your training program can always be improved, whether that be through a career pathway or another way to improve your training program. When you're selecting an intervention strategy, um, specifically, again, paying attention to career pathways and career lattices and ladders, if your workforce data points to a career pathway to train and incentivize current path, do you have the staffing and resources? Um, that's a really important thing to consider. If you maybe don't have the staffing or resources right now, can you get those staffing and resources? And then will this support your workforce at your organization or should you try another workforce strategy first? Um, so while this data and these challenges 
um, all point to career pathways, they also point to other things um, like high early turnover rates might also be the way that you hire or select your staff. Um, it also might be um, those the initial connections that staff are feeling, new staff are feeling within organizations. There are a lot of possibilities for each of these things. So are there other strategies that you should try? Um, one of the things being job description updates to make sure that the job description matches what the job actually is. Um, and another thing being your training, um, the way you train people when they come in. Um, is that something that can be improved? Um, and then step three of that implementation process is to really think about the components of the strategy. Again, in this case, career pathways. Um, so thinking about if you're already, if you're going to use an already existing credential or align with a credential. So maybe your career pathway is gonna consist of like an initial trained DSP. Um, and then the next level would be earning maybe the um, CESP credential, uh, right? Or maybe um, an organization in another state that we've worked with, um, they have <clears throat> their initial training, like I just said, and then they go into the NADSP training. Um, so how are you going to use credentials if you are? Um, another alternative would be to align with a credential. So having your own program, but DSPs, if they want, can engage and get that credential, but it's not a requirement for them to move up in your organization. So there are, other, there are ways to interact with credentials in a lot of different ways. Following that, what training will you use? That NADSP, NADSP certification, that CESP certification, those are all um, credentialing bodies. Um, they don't necessarily provide the training to get the credential. So you would need to think about how you're going to provide that training. And we know through training that a combination of techniques is really good and really allows people to cement their knowledge um, and to understand it. And we also know that competency-based training is really important. Um, so while you're looking for training opportunities, are you going to provide it in-house? Are you going to use online training? Are you going to use in-person classroom training? Um, are you going to pair that with maybe discussions with coworkers? Are you going to pair that with on-the-job training? Are you going to pair that with a mentoring program or a coaching um, program with supervisors? What is your training program going to look like? Um, if you want more information about that, we talk about that in the second webinar. Um, that again, the recording is out there if you'd like to access that. The next question is what incentives will you tie to the program? And this is a tough question. I know this is a tough question for providers um, because the money isn't always there to be able to tie them to the program. Um, and then the next question is how many levels of DSPs will you have? So CESP credential is just one. Um, NADSP is four. Um, will you have other positions and will you have lattices? So will you have a frontline supervisor um, level? Some of the organizations we've worked with started off with like one or two DSP levels and then expanded. That is great. Um, whatever your organization has capacity for is what you should engage in. Um, and then finally, who's eligible for the program? How will people apply to the program? Um, our research shows that um, not everybody's going to want to do this. Um, and that's okay. Not everybody wants to continue to grow in a field. They're happy where they are. And that's totally fine. Some organizations have um, the certain base training for all DSPs, and then DSPs can engage in next levels so they can decide if they want to become a DSP one, two, three, whatever. Um, but that first initial training is required because they have to know how to do their job, right? Um, and then how will you assess participants? So how will you make sure that participants have gotten the skills that you have promised that that career level um, has. And who's gonna assess them? This is a benefit of using NADSP, CESP, outside credentials. You don't have to worry about who's gonna assess them because the outside body is already assessing them. Um, the next step is to identify barriers and that obviously includes funding um, and any other barriers within your organization. 
And the next step, which I like to focus on more, is support. So who are the people who are going to support this? Who do, who do you already have buy-in from? If I was running an organization, I would be that person. Um, I'm really into career pathways, so this would be me at your organization. But who is it at your organization? Um, and then what staffing do you have to support this strategy? Uh, what already existing elements of your training program can you use? So I talked about some of you probably have DSP to supervisor. Um, can you use any of that and just kind of expand it? Are there other organizations that you can partner with? And does this connect to your broader strategic plan or your goals, your mission, your vision, values? That itself is support for the strategy. And then step six is to really set those individual little goals and that progress that you can measure um, and to put different people in charge of each, each goal, right? While you want your whole organization, not your whole organization, but every, a lot of people from your organization to participate in the planning of this and you want people to give feedback, um, there can be one person in charge of each, coordinating each task. Um, so thinking about what your timeline is, knowing that all of this can be adjusted because we know things change, we know there become staff shortages and you have to pause things, um, but really thinking about your plan including how you're gonna get buy-in at your organization and market the program. Because in any program you're doing within an organization, if you don't have buy-in and if you're not marketing it right, it's not gonna work because people aren't gonna to wanna to do it. And then finally, actually implementing the program. So how are you gonna kick off that program and roll it out? Are you gonna pilot the pathway? Um, we recommend piloting it because you can try it out with a small group of people. They can give you feedback and you're not doing it organizational wide and making a bigger mistake that might be hard to reverse. So we really recommend that pilot. So you can try it out, see what works, what doesn't work, make changes, and then roll it out organization wide. Do you have the data you need to track implementation? And do you, as you are implementing the program throughout the time, do you need to update and revise that plan that you made in step six? And then finally, how are you celebrating the plan that you made and each of the steps of the plan? Step eight, I don't wanna rush through, but I see we're running low on time and I do wanna give time for questions. Step eight is to evaluate that program. Um, so how is, how is the pathway impacting people supported? How is it impacting people who are engaging in the pathway and their supervisors? Um, it is, data shows that well-trained people need less time with their supervisors. Um, so it's, that is an impact as well, right? That makes supervisors jobs easier and they can do other things um, with their time. Um, and then what changes need to be made? Just because you're seeing that not positive results, it doesn't mean you should just scrap it. It means that you might need to make some changes and try again. So all of that being said, um, the main questions to consider before you're implementing any new training program, including expanding your pathway, um, would be, do you have the time and resources to implement a training program? Do you have a method for incentivizing staff who want to participate? And will this support your workforce or should you try another strategy first? So does your data point to using a career pathway? Um, is there something else that it points to that you should try first? really digging into this so that you're not wasting your time with things that people at your organization might not want and that might not improve your retention. Um, so that is all that I have for today. I kind of rushed through those last few slides because they do see that we're running up on, we have four minutes left and I do want to give time for any questions. Um, if you have, if you want to see the first, second webinar, if you want to see this again, Danielle, those are all posted on the website on their screen, right? Yes, that's right. Great, so you can see those there, um, but I'm gonna give time for any questions. Or comments. OK, 
Okay, I will continue to stay on if people have questions or comments. Again, if you want to talk about your own experiences, expanding your pathway um, and, and what that has looked like in your organization, we would love that in the chat because um, the best way to learn is to learn from each other. Um, and Danielle just posted in the chat uh, survey for the webinar that you just attended. That's really helpful to us. Um, we'll know what we need to improve and what, what is helpful to you as providers. So um, we really do encourage you to fill out that survey before you leave today. Again, the link for past and future webinars. Um, Danielle, are there other MTI webinars coming up too? Not specific to workforce. There are others um, related to organizational transformation for day and employment providers though coming up. Okay. So if that is something that interests you, you can visit the website on your screen. Um, otherwise, thank you. Um, we're glad you were all here today. Um, 